certain monies didn't get spent that were discretionary that, that could have been spent. So all of a sudden, the sequesters turned out to be not a bad deal overall for our kids. It's a bad deal for some federal agencies. It's not a good way to do it, but it's a whole lot better than not doing anything. So what I would tell you is my approach would be not to use the CR, but to use the debt limit. And let's have the fight on grounds that the American people agree with us on. They agree with us about Obamacare. They don't agree with us about a government shutdown, regardless of who caused it. They think it's incompetency. And I agree with them. You know, it's, it's childish to shut the government down when there are certain legitimate factors of the federal government that ought to be operating every day for all of us. Where are you, Connie? Yes, should I state my name? Oh, you better, look, we got the FBI here is gonna photo you too. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Monty Ellison from uh, Broken Arrow. Yes, sir. And I'm sorry, we, my partner and I got here a little bit uh, late and uh, I didn't quite understand you. Uh, <clears throat> are you for defunding Obamacare or against Obamacare? Just give me a yes or a no. Answer. I'm for defunding Obamacare. I am for defunding Obamacare. Okay, that's what I want to hear, and I think most of the people here in this room want to hear that. And we can count on you to, to vote that way because we're going to be looking and watching you. Well, I, I'm happy. We wanted you to do because we're paying your salary. Uh, Many people here want to give the vote to, I want to see your hands, to, to defund Obamacare. All right, and let me, let me ask the question, let me ask the question a different way. How many of you want me to defund Obamacare if it's going to force a government shutdown and then we're going to cave on the government shutdown? How many of you want that? So, so you have three out of this whole group that want us to do that strategy instead of, I, look, you've missed my point. I don't vote for CRs anyway. I, 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 nobody fought harder, and nobody has led the fight against Obama. You, know, you realize we've gutted six components already out of Obamacare? No, Obama, no, it's not. It's 30 days after that. Well, you're, you and I are going to have to disagree I'd, I think the tactic is a failed tactic. Well, you're missing my point. Look, uh, l let me set one record straight here. It'll offend some of you and others. You elected me to follow the Constitution and making my best judgments in the long-term interest of this country. That's what you elected me to do. You're not going to like every one of my votes. But I do have a 99.2% conservative rating in terms of protecting, no other senator in the U.S. Senate has that high of an average. So I've pretty well gone the line of abiding by the Constitution. But you're asking me to commit to make a, a policy vote that is something I think won't work. So I'm not against, I'm, I'm totally against Obamacare. I think this is a foolish way of getting there. Next, next question. Yes, sir. Um, I'm really sick of big government. I'm sick of the big federal government, and in Oklahoma, we have a pipeline that should already be on, under mm -hmm. way. Last week, the Justice Department did an 11th hour stop on a merger of an airline here. What it makes me feel like is these big bureaucracies, unelected people, the EPA, the IRS, the Justice on, Department, on on, the Justice Department, you can go on and on and on, sir. And it's like they want us to be Detroit. They don't want, we didn't vote for him. 08 and 12, he got no votes from this state. Thank you, Oklahoma. But we're paying for it. And he does an end run around everybody. What can we do to get Oklahomans working, to get these things implemented, without them sitting up there and saying, this is what you're going to do instead of the people that own this country? Well, um, gosh. <laughs> You know, I, I would tell you, don't blame it all on Obama because there were uncontrolled bureaucracies under George Bush. I experienced them, and you did too. It goes back to the thing we kind of started out with, is the federal government is out of control. Uh, but it's been predicted by all the historians that our republic would fail. So the question is, is how do we cheat history? How do we go back? How do we re-embrace the thing that made America great? 
And as I said earlier, I, I think we have to get in charge. And, and, you know, I've been working for nine years to try to make a big difference. I've made a small difference, not a big difference. But, I mean, I've worked every day to try to do that. But I'm convinced the only way we do that is have the states start exerting their Tenth Amendment authority and start reassessing <laughs> through a convention changes to the Constitution that restore federalism and a constitutional republic. And so I, th I think that's the way. You know, you're frustrated. You ought to see me in Washington. Uh, ask my staff. I, I want to pull. Yeah, <laughs> ask my wife. I want to pull my hair out. You know, it, uh, I see it in two things. One is I see the Constitution and I see what's happening to it. And then I see grown men and women who know what the Constitution says but don't care. And that's what really makes me want to pull my hair out. They ignore what the Constitution says because it's better for their political career if they do. And that's an abandonment of their oath. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've already, um, it's not over with. First of all, <clears throat> when you approve Delta and Northwest, and you approve United and Continental, and then you don't approve U.S. Air and American, what you have done is condemn those two airlines to eventually go out of existence. So if, in fact, it was not anti-competitive for those other two, the only reason this is happening is because they want to look tough on antitrust. This, it has nothing to do with the facts of the case. Well, it may be. That may be, too. But the point is, is it's arbitrary and it's capricious. And that's why it's, it's not based on common sense or sound judgment or anti, true antitrust law. It's conjured up. They found seven share codes out of all those codes that were anti-competitive. And they're going to stop that merger on the basis of that? You know, it just shows you how lawless this administration is. And I don't say that word lightly. <clears throat> All right. Um, Senator, my name is Carl Folsom. I'm, uh, I'm one of those federal employees you were talking about, but I, I can assure you I don't make anywhere near $138,000 a year. Um, I'm actually a federal public defender here in Muskogee. I live up in Wagner. And uh, you were talking earlier about the sequester and how it's actually been a good thing in, in uh, decreasing the size of the federal budget. Um, it, it's certainly done that. Um, I guess my question is, or a little background, my agency, we don't have a whole lot of discretionary spending. But as you might expect, the public defenders don't get the biggest budget for the whole federal government. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty lean. And so when there's a big percentage of cut, like sequester is imposing on us, uh, it means we cut people. And we've already lost three employees because of that. We might have to lay off more people at the start of the fiscal year. Um, and the, the funny thing is, we're constitutionally mandated uh, because when you prosecute people, you have to have people defend those people. And, and so if we don't take a case because we lose attorneys, then it will go to an appointed attorney who gets paid by the hour. And it's actually ended up costing the government more money when we can't take these case, uh, can't take these cases. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, as a as a doctor, uh, would you rather perform surgery with a hatchet or a scalpel? I mean, why doesn't Congress step in and pass a budget and say these are the good programs that are efficient, that are necessary? These are the programs that we think there's waste. And why doesn't Congress make that decision instead of uh, just imposing and and tightening down on some agencies that are necessary yeah. uh, and yeah. are efficient. Yeah, I, I, I basically agree with you, the indiscriminate nature of the sequester. And I think I've said all early, earlier, <clears throat> uh, better sequester than nothing. <clears throat> but your agency, by the way, <clears throat> is one of the most wasteful agencies in Washington. And it's not my fault that the money doesn't come to you. Uh, you spent $480 million last year on conferences. The Justice Department, and, and half of those could have been done on 
Well, let me finish the point. Half of those could have been done on video conferencing, but no, we decided to spend $300 a night or $400 a night on rooms. Uh, the, the, the judges are taking a big trip here in the next few, I've already criticized it, it hadn't stopped it, $600 a night rooms. I mean, the fact is, is we're broke. We're out of money. Would, who would you think? Should we have a conference where judges get together or should we pay public defenders? What should we do? Nobody's making that choice. The, so I don't disagree with you that it is unfair the way it's rolled out. But let me tell you, there's no place in the federal government that isn't rife with waste. And uh, let me just give you an example. You never heard one thing from the State Department about the sequester, did you? No, not one peep. Why? Because there's so much waste in the State Department. There's, there's nothing to have a 45 percent cut. And if you had any common sense applied to the management of most agencies, there wouldn't be a problem. The second point I'd make is President Obama, through the OMB, made this sequester much harder than it needed to be. He had the choice of doing two things. He could make the sequester agency-wide, which means program-specific, or he could make it just to the department and let them meet the goals. He chose to make it specific so that it would exert the most pain on the most people so that he could win the battle of increasing spending. That's what he did through the OMB. So they had a choice. And your department probably wouldn't have got a cut at all had he made a choice to do it the smart way, the way a prudent person would do it, is cut the waste, keep the good. But they didn't do that. They went by department, by line item, by facility. And so we have the problems that we have with sequester because of the choice that the president made to make it as painful as possible. Good afternoon, Colbert, and welcome uh, to Muskogee. I'm from the Bragg's Gore area. Will you please explain to the audience what Obama did? It has to do with using the Office of Personnel Management to accommodate the health care needs of uh, staff members in Congress and not forcing staff members in Congress to go onto Obamacare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I actually had raised a question because. I've turned back about 20% of my budget every year in running the office. And I wanted a decision, thank you very much, Bob. I wanted a decision made so I could plan my budget for next year because I think employees that work for me ought to get insurance. And under the plan, I think members of Congress ought to be in anything we ask uh, the American citizens to be. I have no problem with that. But I think, I think asking people who work 15, 18 hours a day some days to give up health insurance or at least the, com the contribution portion of that health insurance from a Senate office isn't fair to those employees, just like it's not fair for you. That's my opinion. Uh, it doesn't make it right. It's my opinion. So I wanted to know what the decision was going to be because I wanted to prepare my budget to be able to buy health insurance for the employees that work both here in the state of Oklahoma and outside. Every other federal employee has a very generous 72% payment towards their health insurance. And in fact, staff are federal employees under the law. So we've accepted those. And I offered an amendment in the health committee during the Obamacare debate that would put members of Congress into the exchanges. I think we ought to experience what Americans are going to have to experience with no contribution from the federal government. I, d I totally disagree with the ruling on members of Congress. I don't disagree with it on, on the employees that work for you uh, that are employed by the federal government. So I think the ruling was totally erroneous. Uh, and out again, outside the law, here's what it said. Uh, and it's again another instance of the lawlessness or the, at least the very loose interpretation of executive privilege, which I assure you is not there. Okay, uh, got right over here, and let's get one back over here, and then we'll finish up.
sacrifices. Uh, I think many of us on that line. <coughs> and I have a very difficult question for you. We talked a lot about the Constitution. We talked a lot about the lawless administration we currently have. Um, the Constitution provides for three branches, executive, judicial, legislative. We have an executive setting president who is rewriting laws, failing to enforce laws he has chosen to pass <coughs> and he wanted to have passed, selecting which part of law he wants to enforce. Um, I want to know who he is accountable to and who is responsible for um, enforcing his constitutional um, requirements and responsibilities. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I know the answer to the question. I believe it's the Attorney General. Uh, oh, yeah. You know that's no good. Yeah. So who's the next? Well, it's the House of Representatives. Okay. Um, and who within the House? The Judiciary Committee? And it's the Judiciary the Committee. What you have to do is you have to establish the criteria that would qualify for proceedings against the president. Uh, and that's called impeachment. Uh, but you, but, but, but that, you know, that's not something you take lightly and you have to use a historical precedent of what that means. Um, you know, I, I think there's some intended uh, violation of law in this administration. But I, also, but I also think there's a ton of incompetence uh, of people who are making decisions. Uh, you know, in Homeland Security, 15 of the 17 stop, top spots right now are empty. And the, I would just tell you, a general portion of the nominees are absolutely incompetent. Even if they're incompetent, I mean, the IRS forces you to abide by the law. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And, and so my, my, little, my little wiggle out of that when I get that written to me is, I believe that needs to be evaluated and determined, but thank goodness it doesn't happen to happen in the Senate until they brought charges in the House. So I think those are, those are serious things, but we're at a serious time. Uh, and so whether, I, I don't have the legal background to know if that rises to high crimes and misdemeanors, but I think they're getting parallelously close as terms of, uh, I, I can just, let me share with you. You know, I had US, USCIS employees these are the people that do the background investigation on immigration, told me personally, managers, that Homeland Security told them, don't worry about it, ignore all the background approved people. I mean, this is the management telling the career employees to do something against the law. So, you know, I'm documenting all this stuff as it goes along, but I don't know where that level is. Uh, I'm kind of like the lady in the back. I'm fed up. I'm frustrated. And... You know, I am happy to raise an issue at every point. Uh, Barack Obama is a personal friend of mine. He became my friend in the Senate. But that does not mean I agree in any way with what he's doing or how he's doing it. And I, quite frankly, think uh, he's in a difficult position he's put himself in. And if it continues, I think we're going to have another constitutional crisis in our country in terms of the presidency. Oh, sure. I, no, it's not just his failure to... Look, I'll make this point. The rule of law is the one thing that this country has better than anything else. The rest of the world looks at us and says, that's the glue that holds them together. Because no matter whether you're poor, a minority, rich, insider, outsider, you have this gentleman in the back who will defend you and make sure that your side of the story gets told. And when you have an administration that undermines the rule of law, here's what happens. The next time I'm at a decision point on the rule of law, I say, well, gosh, if the administration doesn't have to follow the law, and the president doesn't follow the law, and my senator doesn't follow the law, why should I? And all of a sudden, you have a declining, crumbling republic. And what we really need is enhanced fidelity to the rule of law 
rather than the opposite of what we see in this administration. All right, uh, we're, through, we're through with questions. We've gone over what I'll hang around about 10 or 15 minutes to visit with anybody that wants to visit. I want to thank you for coming out. Uh, I'm glad you're here to press your point. I think it's great. I just don't agree with it. Uh, and uh, I've been, you know, I have a little bit of an ornery streak in me, independent streak. Uh, but that's the one reason why I'm challenging things in Washington, too. So uh, you may have heard something here tonight you adamantly disagree with. I got an email, coburn.senate.gov. I'm about 10,000 letters behind right now. So I won't get an answer to you quickly, but I'll answer it, and I'll read it. So uh, email me if you heard something you didn't like and want to educate me on, and uh, let me know your thoughts, and I'll try to... Uh, one of my cost savings for in the sequester is not have quite as many people help me write letters. So it takes a little longer to get a letter to you right now. God bless you. Thank you for being here.